Welcome to our discussion of the 1960s, and I've broken this lecture into two parts. So in 1960, there was a presidential election. You'll recall that General Dwight Eisenhower had been president um, for most of the 1950s, elected um, in 1952, and his vice president was Richard Nixon. Now in 1960, the Democrats nominated John Fitzgerald Kennedy, also known as JFK by his initials, as their candidate. And he promised a new frontier, a new frontier for the United States, and a new frontier in space also. You'll recall when we, we talked about the Sputnik, which was launched by the Soviets in the late 1950s. This was great humiliation for the United States <clears throat> that the Soviet Union, which supposedly was a very backward society, that its scientists and engineers could send the first artificial satellite into space. And as we looked at in that lecture, the American people were very, very humiliated. And they were also very, very concerned that if the Soviets could send a, a satellite, um, th that the fact that the Soviets were a nu nuclear power meant they could send nuclear weapons via satellites. And during the campaign, Kennedy claimed that there was a missile gap with the Soviet Union, a missile gap in the sense that the Soviets had much more effective long-range missiles than the United States. And this gap in missiles and number of nuclear weapons will continue for the next 30 years. <coughs> the, the, not the gap itself, um, but the question of who had more missiles and nuclear weapons uh, would continue. And I, I put here Flotnik and Stay Putnik. You'll recall that's what the, the media called the first U.S. attempts to send uh, a missile into space. Now, the Republican candidate was Richard Nixon, who, as I mentioned a moment ago, had been Eisenhower's vice president for eight years. And I've put in the module a number of very short campaign ads. They're all less than a minute long. I strongly encourage you to watch them. It will give you a real sense of the time. And you will see both Richard Nixon and John Kennedy are saying that they are better candidates to deal with the Soviet threat, the communist threat. Um, Richard Nixon emphasized his years of experience and the fact that he had been vice president of the United States for eight years, whereas uh, John Kennedy had been a, a senator. Now, Nixon was undercut somewhat when President Eisenhower was interviewed and asked if he could remember anything significant that during his eight years as vice president, Nixon may have done a significant initiative or idea. And um, Eisenhower waited a second and said, well, if you give me a week, I might think of something. Well, this really undercut Nixon's claim that he had great experience having served as vice president. And there's a short video clip of that interview in the module. I think you'll enjoy watching that. <clears throat> I also uploaded an advertisement, a political advertisement done in Spanish by Jacqueline Kennedy, known as Jackie Kennedy, who, was, um, who, who speaks Spanish. Obviously, those of you who speak Spanish will enjoy listening to her. I think she does a pretty good job in Spanish. She's obviously not a, a native speaker. And what does this reflect? This reflects the growing number of Spanish-speaking American citizens. So this is a direct appeal to them. Now, the first presidential debate occurred in 1960, and it was on television. Now, television was a fairly new medium. Most homes had television and virtually no one had black and white television at that time. I mean, excuse me, had color television, um, had black and white television. 
And the general consensus was that Kennedy had, quote, won the debate. He'd done a better job. He certainly appeared on television much more energetic and youthful. Richard Nixon appeared tired. Uh, he hadn't shaved right before the debate, which was in the afternoon. And so he looked like he had the so-called five o'clock shadow. He just didn't look dynamic. It's very interesting. They did polls of those who saw the debate on TV, and the vast majority of the people said Kennedy had done much better, precisely because he looked energetic and youthful. But those who listened to the debate on radio and focused on the words people said, the majority said Nixon had done better. Uh, there is a video clip of the debate segment in the module, and this is taken from a Kennedy ad, so it only shows Kennedy speaking um, for about a minute. Uh, they started off sitting down, and then later during the debate, they stood up, and here you can see them on the stage, and uh, you'll notice the old-fashioned uh, camera on the left. <clears throat> now, throughout the campaign, many, many concerns were expressed about the fact that Kennedy was a Catholic and his family was Catholic. Uh, you will recall from your earlier studies of U.S. history the long, long history, unfortunately, of anti-Catholicism in the United States um, in, in the 1920s, as you recall, the Ku Klux Klan um, was against Catholics. Many states closed Catholic schools. In 1928, the Democratic presidential candidate Al Smith um, was Catholic, and many people had attacked him over his religion, and most analysts think that's one of the reasons he lost. So these concerns were surfaced very publicly during the 1960 campaign. They reached the point that uh, John Kennedy, who was a senator at the time, actually appeared in front of a cathedral in New York, New York City with the Catholic bishop, and the Catholic bishop made a statement that should Senator Kennedy become president, um, the Catholic Church would have absolutely no influence on, over him in, in, on, on political issues. Um, Kennedy was very, very anti-communist at this point, as was Richard Nixon. And it's important to note that he, Kennedy, as a Democrat, needed the votes of the Southern Democrats to win. And you'll recall that the Southern Democrats ran the South at, at this time and had for a number of years, and they were extremely racist. They were the, the governors who stood in the schoolhouse doors and blocked little girls, little black girls from going in, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> One thing <clears throat> that helped the black community that Kennedy did was he helped um, as a senator to get... Uh, uh, Martin Luther King, excuse me, as president, he helped get Martin Luther King out of jail. And he, for that, he did get much support from the black community. In fact, he received about 70% of the black vote. Now, Kennedy and his vice presidential running mate, Lyndon B. Johnson, also known by his initials LBJ, uh, won by only 120,000 votes. So it was a very, very close election um, in U.S. terms. And Kennedy really went to great lengths to play up his glamorous image. He was from an extremely wealthy family in the Boston area. And his wife, Jacqueline Kennedy, also came from a very, very wealthy family. Kennedy had sort of a permanent tan. He, he looked youthful, and he looked like 
he had sort of a, ter a permanent glowing tan, so people assumed that was because he was often photographed out sailing on one of his yachts or playing golf or whatever. Actually, the fact is that tan, that look, came from he was suffering very much from Addison's disease. And some people understand with Addison's disease have kind of patches of different colors on their face and body. But in Kennedy's case, it gave him this tanned look. In fact, Kennedy was quite sick and suffered from poor health throughout the 1950s and throughout his presidency. He had almost become paralyzed in World War II when, as commander of a small torpedo boat, his boat was sliced in half, literally sliced in half by a Japanese torpedo. And as the uh, commander, Kennedy, and had gotten the crew together and they s swam, I think it was like five or ten miles to find a little island. And actually there was a, um, a famous book about this and that brought him to national prominence. So, but he continued to suffer from severe back pain throughout his life. He also had severe gastrointestinal issues um, and he was suffering from Addison's disease. And throughout his presidency, he really was not at all effective in pushing his agenda through Congress. He didn't know really how to work with Congress. Um, his vice president, Lyndon B. Johnson, whom we'll see in a moment, uh, would have been effective. And later as president, he did become effective. But uh, Kennedy didn't want him, he didn't want him, Johnson, to uh, deal extensively with Congress. Now, this is a famous photograph of uh, John Kennedy and his wife, Jacqueline, also known as Jackie. You can see the elegance portrayed in this photograph. Uh, this is one of their houses in the Massachusetts area. You can see the beautiful field behind. Jackie Kennedy is wearing pearls. Uh, John Kennedy, well, he is youthful, he is young, but he has a youthful, energetic look. Now let's turn to uh, the Cold War. You recall that we talked about the Berlin airlift in the 1940s, that the city of Berlin, although it was part of East Germany, totally controlled by the Soviet Union, that there was a corridor connecting it to West Germany. And so Berlin, in that sense, uh, was a divided city. Half of it was part of really West Berlin. It was free. People had freedom of speech. They could vote in real elections. They could listen to the, the radio. Uh, they could read whatever they wanted to. And of course, during the Berlin airlift, uh, during that period, about of a year, the Soviets had blocked the corridor. Well, as we saw before, the Soviets backed down, and so Berlin still remained half Soviet, part of East Berlin, which was essentially part of the Soviet Union, and half free. Well, in 1961, the Soviets constructed a wall separating East from West Berlin to stop the refugees fleeing from communism. What was happening, the Soviet Union was very embarrassed. Their propaganda throughout the world was that they had created a worker's paradise. But the evidence was whenever people had the opportunity, they would leave the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. Virtually everyone with the opportunity would flee into the West for freedoms, but economic opportunity. So they all of a sudden, they constructed a massive wall with armed guards, and I have some photos of it in a minute, and would shoot anyone who attempted to walk over, to climb over the wall. And I put in red here, this became a very strong or potent symbol of Soviet repression for the next 30 years. And people would say, people in the West would say, well, if the Soviet Union is so great, if communism is so great, 
why does the, the government have to put up a wall and literally shoot people who try and leave? There were also many people, once the wall went up, who tried to escape by digging tunnels under the wall, and there are many, many TV movies about that. And some of them were successful. Uh, many other people were killed in attempts to, to leave. The destruction we'll see later of the Berlin Wall in 1989 was really the iconic end of the Soviet Union. This was the symbol of Soviet repression and its destruction in 18, 1989 by the German people themselves who went out with sledgehammers and, and physically knocked down a concrete wall. That symbolized sort of the end of Soviet control. Here's a headline from a New York paper in August 1961 that the Reds, I mean the Communists, seal off East Berlin to block refugees, and the, the Soviet forces threatened to fire on protesting crowds. And of course, um, there were many, many people shot who just attempted to escape. This was the situation before they built a massive wall. They had a barrier between East and West Berlin, but as you can see, it's not much of a barrier, just a chain link fence, a little barbed wire at the top. And in this photograph, someone had cut through the chain link fence. And you can see people here with no luggage, nothing. They just wander up and then they run through and escape into West Berlin. Um, could you imagine doing that? They have no, no belongings or anything, but they want an opportunity uh, to travel to, to escape from the, the Soviet controlled section of Germany. Uh, this is now that the wall has been constructed. You can see it's a strong wall with barbed wire at the top. And this is a photograph of people in West Berlin looking over the wall at East Berlin. Um, and this goes right through the middle of a city and we don't see the other side of the wall on East Berlin, but it's painted white, and in front of it is a large cleared area. There are watchtowers with guards and searchlights, and the reason they paint the wall white is if they see someone run up and put a ladder, it's easier to see the person in ladder with a white uh, background. And there was no warning, and people were shot, and there are many, many videos that were taken from high buildings in West Berlin, and you can see... Um, poor people being shot down, uh, trying to escape from uh, East Berlin. Uh, this is 1989. We'll see later in the course exactly why the Soviet Union um, fell. This is a photograph of people in West Berlin, the free part of Berlin, part of West Germany, who managed to cut through the wall and break it down. And then on the other side, there were many thousands of people in East Berlin who were cheering and they would embrace each other. They were all Germans, they spoke the same language. And there are many photos of East German guards standing there with weapons, but not shooting at anyone. This was really, really one of the, probably the most significant events that happened in the last hundred years. And in fact, you can even go on eBay um, and people are selling uh, bits of concrete that supposedly came from the Berlin Wall. I don't know if they did really come from the Berlin Wall or not, but particularly after this happened, many people around the world wanted to have a chunk of concrete from the Berlin Wall because it was such a symbol. <clears throat> well, now let's turn to our own hemisphere, to Cuba. Um, Cuba had been ruled by a dictator, Batista, um, who was friendly to the United States. It was a military dictator. And Cuba had significant investment by U.S. companies. Cuba was also a vacation spot for wealthy Americans to go, particularly in the winter. 
um, people from New York or whatnot would go to Cuba. There were great um, hotels there, restaurants, casinos, etc. And then in the 1950s, uh, Fidel Castro um, uh, took over. After a couple of years, he became actually he. People didn't think he was a communist at first. They thought that he was a people. Th some people compared him to Thomas Jefferson, and he really, when he um, took over, he didn't emphasize his communist ne leanings. But within a year or so, he had he'd created a dictatorship. And so now, during the Cold War, you have a fairly large island close to Cuba fairly close, to, very close actually, to Florida, um, run by a communist government. And of course, when Castro turned to the far left, many, many refugees left Cuba, and that explains the many, many uh, Cubans um, who, who ended up living in Florida, and there's still a significant uh, Cuban-American um, community in Florida. And if you follow the news at all, you know uh, even till today, people are still escaping from Cuba on rafts, and you know many die at sea. Um, the U.S. Coast Guard picks them up, and if people haven't actually put their foot on U.S. soil, they are returned to Cuba. It's a very controversial issue. Um, but in 1961, the United States um, and President Kennedy authorized this, um, an invasion of Cuba, not by U.S. military forces, but by Cubans who had been exiled by Castro or who had left voluntarily. And these were uh, Cubans, many living in Central America, or uh, and they formed a sort of their own army secretly with uh, assistance from the U.S. Department of Defense and the CIA. And they landed in Cuba at what's called the Bay of Pigs. Um, that's the, in Spanish, it's La Bahia de, I forget what it was in Spanish, but it translates as Bay of Pigs. And they landed there in a military invasion with the goal of overthrowing the government and establishing a democratic government. But when this occurred, uh, the troops met fierce resistance, and they asked for U.S. aircraft to provide cover. President Kennedy refused. He said the U.S. didn't want to be directly involved in this, uh, even though the U.S., of course, had paid for this invasion and trained the troops, and it was, it was really a U.S.-sponsored invasion, albeit not with American soldiers, but with um, Cubans who were living outside of Cuba. And the, the Bay of Pigs invasion failed. Everybody who landed on the beaches was arrested. Well, this obviously was a great humiliation to Kennedy when it came out. And it came out because, you know, Castro broadcast uh, videos and images of the Cubans and this really made Castro a hero of the left, particularly in Latin America. And um, he and his brother have remained, uh, well, Castro, of course, is dead, Fidel Castro, but his brother um, have remained heroes of the left ever since, particularly in Latin America. Well, this is from Life magazine, which was a, a very well-known in widely read magazine at the time. And this is just, um, these are interviews a couple of years later by some of the actual Cubans who had uh, landed at the Bay of Pigs. <clears throat> now, still in Cuba, this is, now we'll turn to a year later, so uh, Kennedy had approved an invasion of Cuba, which failed. Now, a year later, U.S. intelligence planes flying over Cuba. Um, these are planes taking very high resolution photographs from high altitude. And they showed very clearly Soviet missiles and heavy bombers 
in Cuba. And you can see the boat, the ships coming in from the Soviet Union. And it was very, very clear uh, photographic uh, images of these missiles and bombers. Obviously, this was a threat to the United States. Um, Soviet Union had nuclear weapons. And US intelligence was very concerned that these bombers and missiles would have nuclear weapons. There was no direct evidence of that, but it was hard to see in photographs. I mean, a nuclear weapon is pretty small. Uh, so Kennedy put the US Navy around Cuba to blockade Cuba to prevent any more ships from the Soviet Union coming. And when ships arrived, uh, the Soviet ships, they actually turned around. And there's a video in the module of Kennedy's address to the nation on October 22nd, 1962, which was watched by a very, very anxious public because there was a great fear that the Soviets would retaliate with a nuclear missile launch from the Soviet Union or it would activate some of the missiles and supposedly nuclear weapons already in Cuba, uh, which had the range to strike major cities in the United States from Miami to New York City to Chicago. At this time, the United States had about five times more nuclear weapons than the Soviet Union, so it was in a stronger negotiating sense. And fortunately, the Soviet Union backed down um, this was monitored closely by U.S. intelligence. The Soviets uh, sent ships, empty ships, that took out all the large bombers and the missiles. As part of this agreement, and it wasn't made public at the time, uh, the U.S. agreed to remove United States missiles that were based in, term in Turkey and targeted on the Soviet Union. Uh, this is an image of uh, President Kennedy speaking on that speech I mentioned in October 1962. And here are people <coughs> who don't have TV at home, and they're uh, watching in a, a store that sells televisions. They're just watching what the Kennedy has to say. The whole country was on edge for several days. People thought that you know the war was about to end with a major nuclear confrontation. Well, in 1963, partly as a reaction to the Cuban Missile Crisis and increased fears that, you know, there's a real possibility here of a nuclear attack, um, the U.S. and Soviet Union entered into a test ban treaty. Now, this did not require either country to destroy nuclear weapons or missiles, but what it required is the testing of nuclear weapons must be done underground. It could not be done above ground. Previously, both the United States and the Soviet Union had been detonating major nuclear weapons, strong nuclear weapons, just above deserts or on islands in the Pacific, such as the Marshall, U.S. Marshall Islands in the Pacific. Um, and it's incredible how much you know, radioactive fallout had been released into the atmosphere. So this was an attempt to reduce the radiation risk to, to the humans. Well, shortly thereafter, in November 1963, as we all know, um, Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas. Following his assassination, he became something of a martyr. And he actually, his reputation improved significantly after his assassination. Because as I mentioned before, he had not really been effective in getting his program through Congress. And after his assassination, his vice president, Lyndon Baines Johnson, known as LBJ, became president. Here we have a photo, I'm sure you've seen this or something similar, with Kennedy riding with his wife Jackie uh, through the streets of Dallas. And you notice that there's no protection for him. There's no bulletproof glass or whatever. And another famous photograph of Lyndon Johnson 
taking the oath uh, to become president. He's actually on the plane. Uh, this is President Air Force One, which is the plane used by the President of the United States. They are returning to Washington with Kennedy's body on the plane and to the right of and the photograph to the right of Johnson is, of course, Jackie Kennedy. And on the other side of Lyndon Johnson is his, his wife. Let's <clears throat> turn briefly to civil rights. We'll, we'll cover this more in subsequent lectures also. Now, the civil rights movement, uh, particularly following the, what we saw in the late 1950s, the 1954 Supreme Court uh, Brown decision, the Montgomery, Alabama bus boycott led by Martin Luther King Jr. Now you had more activism. You had some sit-ins by blacks and whites, and these were nonviolent. Sit-in meant they went to a restaurant or a lunch counter where blacks were not allowed to sit, and they just sat there. They weren't violent. They were refused service, um, and they were often met with violence, but uh, this was to draw attention to the cause. And I said by blacks and whites because uh, in the South, you've got to remember, not every single white was, was racist. You had some whites who actively supported the blacks in their struggle for um, equal rights, and so they would sometimes sit at sit up at the lunch counter or in the restaurant with the blacks and perhaps sing a song or something. And all of them were often beaten, uh, both blacks and whites who were sympathetic. You also had freedom rides. Freedom rides <coughs> were where uh, blacks would get on buses and sit in the white section. And they also had many, many United States college students who would come down on summer vacation or winter vacation and to try and assist the blacks. They'd come down in buses from the north and try and assist. And this led to really massive coverage, um, not only the newspapers and radio, but the television. And television is a relatively new medium now. Most people only got television in the early to mid-1950s. So here, within 10 years, most people have TV at home, and they can see with their own eyes what's happening. And we'll see in a few minutes when they saw massive uh, uh, retaliation by whites against the blacks, it led to more awareness of the situation. Unfortunately, President Kennedy did nothing really to help the blacks, virtually nothing. In fact, he dismissed these people as, quote, publicity seekers. So here we have a famous photograph of uh, black students uh, sitting at a lunch counter. Um, this is in a store. They often have these lunch counters where you'd sit down. And no blacks were allowed to be sitting there. Although you see on the left, you have a black person, but that's someone who works, who works in there. Uh, and so, oops, here you have another photograph. Uh, here they are, people throwing things at them. People would spit at them. The white waitress went up and threw a pie in someone's face. And the gentleman, sit, the white man sitting on the left, who he's a supporter of the blacks, and he has stuff thrown on him too. So he's one of the whites, as I said, who supported the blacks. And the girl or woman next to him, uh, who's looking away from us, she's white also. You'll see that. And uh, you see she's having someone is about to throw a can of beer, throw beer or something on her. On her. And you do have that one black uh, woman sitting there who's obviously getting things thrown on them. Also, um, so you had a number of, these are called sit-ins, because these are lunch counters on the edge of stores, and they're sitting there in an area that's reserved well, for whites only. Now you look at the people in the back, you can see them, you can just see the hatred on many of the faces of those white people who had, had, had grown up 
you know, very racist, what they've been taught at home. And uh, unfortunately, <laughs> and so you can see this explosive confrontation and it required great, great patience by those um, being, you know, attacked not to respond with violence. This is a, a bombing of a bus. This is a bus in which a number of people were killed on one of the freedom rides. Now, Martin Luther King um, chose to have a massive protest in Birmingham, Alabama. He chose Birmingham, Alabama. Why? Because he knew, and it was well known, that the police chief in Birmingham, Alabama, and the city government there were extremely, extremely racist. And what Martin Luther King wanted to do was generate television and newspaper coverage of the brutal reaction by the police because Martin Luther King did not want to institute violence. He um, was very adamant with his supporters that they could not strike back if hit. They could just sing songs like we shall overcome or whatever and that would be much much more effective. And as I mentioned in a previous lecture, he modeled his movement on Indira Gandhi's nonviolent movement in India. And so uh, Martin Luther King started this, uh, this protest in Birmingham because of its reputation. You recall his earlier bus boycott had been in Montgomery, Alabama, which is where he lived. And many, many Americans were totally outraged by the television images of the police attacks on black people singing you know, their arms locked, just singing, we shall overcome or something else, and police dogs be turned on them or whatnot. And these were Americans, including whites in the South, some whites in the South who had grown up in a segregated society, but when they saw these shocking images, they really, really were outraged by, by what was happening. Um, and so Martin Luther King was very, very effective in using the television. He realized, um, well, newspapers were important and a photograph, it's nothing, there's nothing like seeing a video. And of course we see that today with video clips of, of many, many issues. And um, that you know, really, really has impact. And so it was a success for Martin Luther King and the protesters because the city agreed to end racial segregation. So this was a success. And I might add, Martin Luther King had the protesters um, go through training, particularly those who would go and sit in a, in, a, in a store at a lunch counter and ask to be served for the blacks and the whites with them, and knowing that they would be spat on, so they actually practiced and they only wanted to select people who weren't going to react so they'd have five people sit down for instance and um, people working with them would like throw pies in their face or you know spit at them and if you know most of us I think I would would, would jump up and push the person back but if you did that Martin Luther King said no we don't want you in that restaurant protesting because we don't want someone to take a video of you standing up and pushing the other person back because that could be edited and it makes it look like you have started the violence. So you have to take, have great self-control, cross your arms, and just take what people can uh, give you. It required uh, training and patience, but it really, really succeeded in um, changing public opinion. So here we have a photograph from the Birmingham Riots. There is a, a two or three minute clip in the module. I encourage you to watch actual television coverage. And here we have uh, a black man being attacked by a dog. And sometimes these dogs would like tear, you know, skin or whatever. Um, had, fi had fire hoses turned on people. I mean, strong, strong fire hoses that would knock people 10 feet. Um, here we have Martin Luther King Jr. giving his famous I Have a Dream speech. 
in Washington, D.C., on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, and you know, there's a video of this in the module. Um, please watch this. This is one of the most important speeches, I think, in U.S. history. And you can see, uh, listen to his speech, his dream. His dream is about one day a little black girl, a little black boy can, you know, walk in harmony and, uh, to school and whatever. Uh, you can hear the power of his words. As I mentioned in a previous lecture, he was a, a preacher. Uh, he was a great orator. And when you look at the video, you can also see uh, there are many, many whites in the audience who obviously support Martin Luther King. And if you haven't been to Washington, D.C., when you go, you can, uh, and you're on the steps of the uh, Lincoln Memorial, you can see there's a gold star that has been embedded in the concrete uh, up about halfway up, and that's where um, Martin Luther King stood to give this famous speech. Okay, this concludes the first part of this lecture, and we'll conclude uh, in part two. Thank you.